are the world's most interesting people? And what fascinating, groundbreaking, incredible things can they teach us? In this new series, I leave our Science of People lab to interrogate, I mean interview, my favorite authors, experts, and celebrities for them to share their best people hacks, social skills, and stories. And let me tell you, they have some juicy tips. This is a new series I'm calling The World's Most Interesting People. Hello, hello, YouTube friends. Today for this installment of World's Most Interesting People, I have a gentleman who has so inspired my work and has been a huge role model to me. I am so grateful to have Eric Barker on the show. A little bit about him. Eric Barker's insightful, funny, and hilarious blog, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, gives science-based answers and expert insight on how to be awesome at life. He has been featured in New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic Monthly, The Financial Times, to name a few. His book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, You Must Get It, is a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Welcome, Eric. Great to be here. Thank you so much. So I have to start off by asking, you know, uh, I'm obsessed with science. I've loved your blog forever. You have this science-based blog, Helping People Be More Awesome, which is the best tagline I've ever heard. What gave you the idea to start Barking Up the Wrong Tree? Uh, I was at a crossroads in my life. I had worked in Hollywood for like a decade and I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. And I was looking for answers and, you know, a lot of stuff you see on the, on the internet is, you know, sometimes stuff that people just kind of cooked up over lunch. And I was like, what's the best answers I could find? So I started looking at scientific research and I started realizing that there's answers to a lot of questions we're all asking, but you know, nobody looks in these, uh, these dusty academic journals. Did you have any idea that it would be as popular as it is? I mean, did you have an inkling like, you know, this is going to be big or like, this is going to be for three scientific readers and that will be it? I, I, I had no idea. I just, all, all I thought to myself is I'm reading this stuff. I might as well just throw it up on the internet <laughs> and kind of like, I'm going to do this work. And this is like the exhaust that's coming out the back of the car. And if, if anybody wants this exhaust, like, okay, uh, you know, what a delightful metaphor. But, uh, but no. <laughs> I like, I like, the, I, I love the idea of just exhaust. Yes, like I it, just right? pollute the world with my reading uh, and, and subsequent my writing. But no, I, I had no idea. But, you know, some, luckily, thank God, they caught on. So you like me. I mean, I, I read a lot of academic journals and most of them are boring. Some of them are okay. And occasionally you find something amazing. Um, is there ever a study that you came upon and you've read a lot that you're like, it just blew your mind. Like what was the study that sort of just blew you away and you were excited to write about it? If you can remember. I mean, it's, it's always, it's always interesting to me when stuff basically validates either either completely validates or utterly contradicts right. um the uh the things uh but i would have to say like some of paul bloom uh paul bloom's done a lot of uh, work at yale putting together uh he wrote a whole book about it called against empathy and like we most people don't really think about what empathy is they just think empathy good yeah. so you're not allowed to say empathy bad no. and but he puts all the work together and it's like yeah it's, he's like Empathy, we got to be careful about it because actually compassion is better. And it's so funny when you, somebody sits you down and says, no, like empathy, we don't always, if you're in pain, you don't want your surgeon to be in pain. Sure. That his feeling, what you're feeling, not, not good. People, when people, when you're in pain and they need to drive you to the hospital, you don't want them in physical, they're not going to drive well. Right. Versus compassion, the desire to, the emotional desire to help you, that's great. Mm. So like, those little subtle distinctions to where it's like, wow, I don't need to feel what you're feeling. I just need to ha want to have the desire to alleviate your suffering. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that just makes like relating to other people and like dealing with people like kind of crystal clear. Also, I like that too, because um, the way that I think about it is if you're with a friend and they're like, oh my God, I'm going through such a hard time. And they're like, oh, I get hard time. And they start talking about hard times as well. I don't know if you necessarily want that empathy. You'd rather have compassion, which is, I'm so sorry. What can I do to help? Yeah. It's like a very subtle thing. So um, one of the things I like to do in these YouTube videos is any action steps for readers. So I love this idea of turning empathy on its head. I never quite thought about that way, but maybe if you're with someone who needs you or um, you're trying to develop a quality within yourself, compassion might be a little better than empathy. There's a lack. Oh, no. I mean, because, you know, empathy, empathy also leads to burnout. Like for your feeling, you feeling 
you know, nurse, so social worker, <laughs> therapist, that other person is experiencing the worst day of their life. Yeah. So now you're experiencing the worst day of every person's life every day. That's not going to work out really well over the long term versus trying to help people. It's, you know, it's really great. So yeah, I think compassion over empathy is like, a, is a great lesson. Oh, I like it. Okay. So the flip side of that question, I just asked for like the favorite one. Was there ever a study you came across that you're like, I can't publish this. This is going to break the internet. It's going to offend everyone. It's horrible. I mean, you see a lot of stuff like that, but the, the issue is more, you know, the, I always find it's interesting when you look at the issue of like cognitive biases that we all have, you know, because people's instinctive reaction is to go, oh, I know somebody like that, but I don't do it. <laughs> right, of course. And you know, that's like people's natural reaction. So I think always trying to bridge that gap is always a critical thing because people will acknowledge, oh, that's a problem but not for me. And what I believe Kahneman and Dan Ariely would do is they would first show people visual illusions. And so people would be fooled. And then once you show people, oh, okay, here's these cognitive biases, then people have to deal with the fact, no, 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 I was just fooled, I can be fooled. And then people are much more open to the idea than opposed to, no, just my, my stupid uncle that I argue politics with at Thanksgiving. He yeah. does that, but I don't, I don't do that. So what's, you know. what's a great takeaway for this, and um, cognitive biases is a huge issue, but even in your workplace, if you have someone who's like, it's everyone else, but it's not me, which happens a lot. Like a lot of my students who come to me for people skills, yeah. I have students who literally say, I have great people skills, but everyone else is awful. So I'm taking this class for them. Um, if you have people like that, one way that you can kind of fight that is by, testing them ahead of time. So one of the things we like to do is give body language quizzes, nonverbal quizzes, emotional quizzes ahead of time, because if they fail it, they can't really argue with that grade. So um, if you can set up uh, things ahead of time, uh, sometimes that can help people be more open-minded to some kind of behavioral change. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. So, okay. I love your book, Barking Up the Wrong Tree. And it's it's so filled with incredible nuggets. I limited myself to just my favorites. And the title of chapter four is intriguingly called, It's Not What You Know, It's Who You Know, Unless It Really Is What You Know. Um, and you tell the story of a mathematician who was a catalyst for other mathematicians. And that the research found that on average, how close you were to him predicts how good of a mathematician you, mathematician you are. So can you tell me a little bit about this concept of who you know, what you know, which is more important? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because uh, there's been, there's been more, more work in terms of this where, you know, one thing that I find is a very interesting way to look at it is just the issue of clear metrics. So if you look at, you know, uh, movie box office, you know, they, they release it every week. You can see the numbers. Mm -hmm. There they are. Mm -hmm. Boom. You know who number one is, you know, number two is, yeah. uh, you know, we talk about salaries and inside companies, you know, it's been a big debate. Should, should people know what other people's salaries are? Oh my God. Yet, when major league baseball players or NFL players, they sign a contract, that's on the front page of New York Times. So you know what people are making there. So if there are clear metrics, mm. you know, it's very easy to determine who's doing well. In sports, you know, metrics are really big. In the marketing department at uh, X Corporation, you don't really know who's responsible for what. Mm -hmm. So in general, the clearer metrics are, the more it is an issue of skill, especially repeated over time. And the blurrier things are where we don't have clear metrics, we don't know fog of war who is responsible, you definitely see more, more networking type issues. So across the board, it's like you always want to be thinking, one of the key things I talk about in the book is alignment, just that issue of what kind of person am I? Where are my strengths? Where are my weaknesses? And how does that fit into the environment? Am I somebody who's bigger on networking? Am I somebody who's a better individual contributor in terms of hitting marks? And then asking yourself, this environment I'm putting myself in, what is that value? And are those two really aligned? So it's interesting to look at terms of, you know, what, what does this situation demand and where are my strengths? And then to, to, to go from there. So basically what you're, what you're saying is that it's not necessarily important if you're trying to get ahead or you have a career goal to look at who you know or your network. It's also important to look at the skill set and how that might lend to your goal. Is that kind of? Yeah, I mean, if you can, I, the, you know, networking, I think, 
networking across the board is valuable. Yeah. You know, it's like yeah. we've we've seen that. But if people can be evaluated clearly, mm -hmm. you know, then networking tends to matter less. And if there aren't clear metrics, then networking tends to matter more. But overall, you know, there there aren't any arenas where networking doesn't matter the least bit. But that seems to be in some of the, the more recent research, that seems to be one of the tipping points. So an interesting action step here, and I've never ever recommended this in my life, but hearing you say that makes complete sense, that if you're in a career where you can actually rank yourself, in other words, could you join a Toastmasters that ranks you number one? Is there a competition you can do? Is there a startup weekend that you could do? <laughs> Is there a magazine, you know, best lawyers of, you know, in Detroit? maybe that's not such a bad thing because then you're actually adding ranking to you're adding a, a, a metric to what you do, which could help you alleviate the pressure to network. Is that a crazy recommendation? I, no, that's, that, that, that's the kind of thing where I think I forget what the research was, but it was basically in terms of success in the art world where art is completely based on taste. So now all of a sudden exhibiting in the best galleries, which is completely dependent upon networking, um, was the biggest contributor to people's success because there was no way to say this is the best art. However, you know, if you get a perfect score on the SATs, if you, you know, score high on any kind of ranking, we can talk about, you know, okay, the, the qualitative issues of movies and books, but we do know bestseller status, number one at the box office. So, you know, do you have, is there some way to rank that anything that delineates itself like that will, will tend to pull you away from completely dependent upon who you know and associate more with what you know. I like it because for all of my fellow rec recovering awkward people watching, maybe adding some metrics to what you do can take the pressure off of having to network, right? That's it. Absolutely. Exactly. Everybody pays attention to the CEO. <laughs> so I have a question, speaking of recovering awkward people, um, you know, you write about people, you study people, and there was a little line in your book that intrigued me. Um, you wrote, my mom told me to be a people person. Full disclosure, I'm not. Come on, I'm here alone writing this book. Um, yeah. I was, I, I'm a recovering awkward person myself, so this totally resonated with me. I love writing because it's a very solo activity. Um, and I feel like I study people because I'm not a people person. And so I was wondering what drives you to study people? Are you scratching your own itch? Are you just curious? Where, tell me a little bit more about uh, that. Because people make no sense to me whatsoever. So that was, that was, that, that I'm, I'm not a people person and they don't make sense. So that has led me to want to learn more about it. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I, I am, uh, I'm, I'm flying the introvert flag, uh, you know, away. I haven't got my tattoo yet, but <laughs> you know, no, no, totally. It's, it's, it's something that didn't, doesn't come naturally to me. And, and, and that makes it tricky because it's not a very formal system. You don't just, there's not very clear bounded rules. It's not like learning math or the guitar. Okay. Um, so, so that's what, but that's also what makes it interesting. So it's it's cool and it's kind of by definition interactive yeah um i have a bonus question for you here which is if you were going to get a tattoo of the word introvert where would you get it uh well i i i would say forehead but <laughs> i have no i you'll never look I, again <laughs> but nobody else is going to see it because i'm probably not going to be dealing with anyone so it so it 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 really wouldn't matter so it would it would, it would probably be probably be uh, inner forearm, and it would probably be facing inward, not outward, because I'm the one reading it. I'm not going to be near anyone else. <laughs> I like it. Um, okay, a kind of logistical question here is, a lot of people watching are research geeks, science geeks. How do you do your research? Do you have a favorite databases? Do you have a system for like, okay, I want to write about charisma. I'm going to research in this database, this library book. How do you do it, like mechanics-wise? Uh, I still use old school RSS feeds uh, from journals and then I just every day whatever whatever new journal articles and stuff will come up and then uh, I just I read a lot of books just because I'm interested in it I'm just because I'm interested in reading the books science wise but they often lead me down the rabbit hole in terms of Oh, I didn't know that. Like, you know, I've seen the marshmallow study 60,000 times, but I've never seen this study before. Yeah. Hey, I need to go, I need to go find this. 
Uh, yeah, thanks. Never heard of mirror neurons before, but yeah, but hey, wow, here's something. And then I'll find something I've never heard of. And I'm like, wait, did you just make this up? You're not, you're not fooling me. Yeah. And I'll like, I'll, and then I'll like go down, I'll look for it. But every day I try to keep up on like RSS going on. And then eventually I think, and I'm sure you've seen this too. It's like, you start to develop a gut for things because you've, you're like, yeah, I've seen, I've seen stuff like that 10 times. Yeah. Versus, whoa, wait a second, that seems to contradict everything I've seen, yeah. unless your methodology is really interesting, really unique, or you got an enormous sample size, or something's going on there, that, that's kind of something queasy, not good, got to check. <laughs> so you, you, start to, you start to see like what's interesting, or what looks like, hey, wow, maybe that is the next evolution, the next step. Mm -hmm. So I, I, just, I just try and just keep reading, mm -hmm. and that's... <laughs> I don't know if that's sustainable, but it's working for now. I think it's sustainable also because you're an introvert, so you're not going to hang out with people, so you might as well keep reading, right? You're going to have you're yeah. all the time in the yeah. world. Um, no, I mean, that's not, I might, I, I, I will not lose the ability to read English. I might be bad at speaking it because I don't use that anymore. <laughs> and I'm not sure my legs work because I don't get up, but, you know, but I'm learning a lot. We'll just keep doing interviews to make sure that your your speaking muscles are still working. <laughs> that's what we'll do. That, that'll that that'll be great. Oh. It's just oh oh man, it just it gets really it gets hard to talk. Jaw. I know. Um, I, actually, what you mentioned, I think there's an action step there, which is um, one of the things that I hear a lot of very successful people do, and I've done a couple of these interviews now with interesting people, and a lot of them say that they're avid consumers. They don't always use the word learners, but they're avid consumers, and so I think that. If you want to get good at something or knowledge about something, you have to think of um, your brand like a funnel, right? The more you put in the top, the more you're going to be able to sift down into something good. I'm sure, Eric, you read 50 or 60 RSS feeds to get one good one. Is that, how, what is the quota there, if you had to guess? Well, but that's, no, you're, you're really hitting on something that's really critical where it's like, because people will say to me, they'll be like, oh, wow, it must take you a really long time to write, you know, that blog post. And it's kind of, you know, it's like, wow, to, to read the book and then really write it. And, say, and I'm like, you're not even thinking about the four books I had to read that had nothing in them yeah. that were useless. Yes. Where there's dead ends. It's like, that's the other part where it's like, yeah, how much stuff. But the good thing is over the long haul, like I said, you know, by, by, look, by reading all that stuff that doesn't have any direct usage, you start to build that build that gut where you start to be able to say that makes sense that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. because you've just churned through so much stuff and also you start to get to know names who's reliable who's not reliable right. what methodology works what doesn't work okay where 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 are the hubs where they always produce good stuff on this versus that so you know it's yeah it's like just having that funnel where you're always taking things in always it, it has a lot of like meta effects that don't directly improve things but over the long haul all of a sudden you start to say huh i'm really curious about this oh you know what that's probably roy baumeister is fsu he's done something on that or at least if i check who he co-authored with they'll be and it's all of a sudden that just happens after a while yeah and so this whatever area i think that you watching are want to be an expert in this could be food this could be a research study this could be skills the more you consume not only in the direct channel that you like but even in related channels right so if you, if you take food for example if you want to be an expert in food yeah you should eat lots of gourmet food but you should also eat lots of crappy food lots of food right from the earth you know food that you grew food that your your grandma made and your friend made because that way you're going to find what Whatever that one thing that you want to know more about, you're going to get to funnel it down into that. And so I think it's the same thing. It's a very useful way to look at consuming information. Yeah. All right. Um, I wanted to ask you, it's kind of a big question. So it's kind of a dreamer question, which is you have done so much research and a lot of it is habit changing, life changing, relationship changing. But if you had to give a TED talk on one big idea, you know, TED is all about one big idea in 18 minutes. If you had to give a TED talk about just one idea, what do you think it would be about? Wow. That's, wow. I haven't, I haven't thought about, I haven't thought about that so much. I can, I can definitely narrow it down. Okay. You know, uh, you know, one, one, crit, one critical, one critical idea, you know, I, I think that is, is really important is like the idea of kind of, uh, of self-compassion mm -hmm. of just, you know, being able to, the issue of acceptance, being 
understanding yourself. I mean, self-compassion goes all the way back to, you know, origins of Buddhism, but you've seen a recent work by Kristen Neff validating a lot of that. She's at the University of Texas at Austin. And self-compassion is basically just, you know, being kind to yourself in your own head. Mm. You know, instead of that critical voice, that's always kind of, you know, just being perfectionistic, you know, being demeaning or being disappointed or ashamed, you know, is being a little bit more accepting of yourself and supportive of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's a, a valuable lesson for, for anybody. So that, that would definitely be in probably the top three for, uh, for TED Talk subjects. You should do it. You should do it. I won't hold you to it, but for the TED Talker coordinators out there watching, that's a really good one. <laughs> There's an asterisk on that. I, I, that. That's a possible revision. Okay. 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 I won't hold you to it. Um, so I have a kind of business question for you, which is, you know, your blog, your subscribers have grown, grown to over 330,000. As you've watched your business and your blog grow, was there a tipping point or how did you get it to grow or to just kind of go organically? You know, what, what fuel were you adding to that fire? I mean, the, the key thing for me was really just, I mean, was, I mean, make it, making it easy for people to share. Mm -hmm. And I think really a focus on the content because I think a lot of, a lot of stuff is very quick. Like people, people think, oh, hey, it's gotta be short. People don't have a long attention spans. People don't, it's like, yeah, but then you're not separating yourself from the pack. And to me, it was like, no, I'm gonna try and create like a valuable resource. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even, even without like, trying not to, to be value neutral, to not, to not be, you know, hubristic about this. It's like, I at least want people to look at the stuff I post and say, hey, I don't, I'm not interested in this. I don't agree with it, but I can look at it and say, that took a lot of work. Yeah. You know, this person did invest in a lot of effort. That's something you can be objective about yeah. is to say, that was not easy. I couldn't do that myself. So to be able to treat it like I'm creating resources for people, you know, I kind of just went against the grain in, sense, in the sense of, oh, hey, quick, here's one study and it gives you this one idea. There's tons of that. And I think to give people something that really walks them through it, explains it to them, makes sense for it. I think that's something where there's links to research, names are mentioned, statistics, numbers, but it's still accessible. It's, you're giving people enough where it's valid, but it's readable, it's still fun. Uh, I think that made something that was that was useful, that was shareable, uh, that that would get that would come up in in Google because it it was treated like a resource. Um, that was part of syndication, you know, getting getting the word out. But to me, it starts with the content because there's tons of content out there, but most people don't spend the time. Mm -hmm. And I think we all know stuff that we feel is good or that somebody put a lot of effort in stands out. Yeah. And the action step here is, I think what you said earlier was so poignant, which was you should always be proud of what you're putting out, whether or not someone agrees with it or like it's, it's for them or not. They can say, objectively speaking, someone put a lot of time and effort into that. I think that's a, a wonderful way to approach all of our work, um, which I, yeah. I love. Um, did you have any tipping points with the blog, like any syndication areas or per people who tweeted you or I always love tipping points in careers. I mean, you know, the big thing, it was, it was more about like the issue of just getting, it was more the issue about like finding, there's this balance where on one hand, you're, you're, you're looking to, you know, see what readers are interested in, but then you're, you're kind of like, there's two goalposts. It's like, what am I interested in? What are my readers interested in? Yeah. And you don't want to, if you go off totally what you're interested in, <laughs> okay, you might be the only one. Right totally into what people are interested in and you're not then it's just like yeah, it. i mean that, that that well then just make porn you know mm -hmm. that does really well you know it's like no it's like okay i'm not a convenience store this isn't like 7-eleven well, so the, the famous quote is um if you keep optimizing you just gets you to porn right like, yeah you just, no, that's, that's where you that's go yeah so it's like where's where's that line to where you say, hey, the Venn diagram overlaps. I'm interested in this, my readers are interested in this, and you get to a point where you kind of say, and, and, if, and, and there are going to be some people who are not interested in this, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. 
So like when people aren't able to say that, that second part, that's where you get into trouble because then you're going to end up kind of being lukewarm to everybody versus once you can say, Hey, there are plenty of people that enjoy this. This is what I make. There may be some people who aren't and it's not for you. That's okay. Then you can really please these people by, by saying, no, this is what I do. Like I, I get, I, <laughs> I get almost equal amounts of email going, Oh my God, you know, your blog posts are way too long. That's that's that you should make them shorter. And then I get other email going, you know, you didn't, you didn't give enough information about that one. Could you put a little bit more? And I'm like, you're not gonna totally win. Amazing. And, but to decide, it's obvious. So it's that critical element of like, like I said, what are you interested in? What are people interested in? And drawing a line where you say, that's not what I do. Co cocaine is a very big business. <laughs> a lot of corporations kind of draw a line and say, yeah, yeah we don't sell that. Yeah. Very lucrative. Definitely very lucrative. Not what we do. Yes. I love it. So being, being, I love the action step here is uh, know who you are, know what you want. And you can tie that into what people want, but don't only give people what they want. Because it leads you to co cocaine and porn if we keep going down that path. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to judge, but that's not what I do. So. <laughs> there you go. Watch that be my quotable from this video. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I have one last thought experiment for you, which is you consume so much information about people and relationships and communication. And if you had someone who was at the very beginning of their career or at a pivotal point in their career, and you had to give them advice about people, something you've seen over and over again, what piece of advice would you give them? I mean, it's, it sounds so cliche, but, you know, that ability, learn some active listening skills, mm. you know, because most people are terrible, terrible listeners. Mm. I'm a terrible listener. Like it, it's, it is, does not come natural yeah. to most of us and just learning to be able to ask open-ended questions, you know, to, to, to show, to, to give people uh, paraphrased understanding of what they said to make them not the issue, not that people think, Oh yeah, I am listening. No, the issue is the other person needs to know you're listening. You know, you saying, Oh, I'm listening. No, the key part is that other person going, wow, they're really paying attention. Wow. They're really understanding me. Oh, they just summed it up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's really the critical thing. So it's like, if you can start with, you know, getting some listening skills and, actually putting them to use, uh, I mean, you can see dramatic changes very, very quickly. And it leads to a lot of other good habits as well. You know, a trap that I feel like I have uh, perpetuated on accident was one thing that I love is conversation starters. So I love creating interesting conversation starters and questions. And I talk about them all the time on my YouTube channel, but I have missed, I think a couple of times, the critical piece, which is if you ask a really amazing question, <laughs> You have to listen to the answer and then hopefully you can build upon the answer a little bit, right? So not only are they going to answer it, but you're going to listen to it, take it in and say, oh, that reminds me of this or how about this or ask this question back. And that is really, really hard to do in a conversation. So it's not just asking good questions. I think it's also figuring out how you can add to it, sum it up and make sure they know that you're listening to it. Well, I mean, that, that's the difference between like, you know, one good exchange and actually a good conversation where it's like, how does, how does this build into something bigger where, you know, that, and I mean, once you learn to like manage multiple threads and use open-ended questions and kind of see what, what people are passionate about and, you know, it's like, it, it takes time, but it's like, definitely, I'm sure you've, you've seen, it's like the more time you spend, it's a skill. It's not something you can just practice in the mirror. It's like you spend the time and you get better at it, but you know, it, it, it's really listening is listening is so critical and learning those fundamental active listening skills makes a huge difference. It's a muscle for sure. It's something you have to, <laughs> to work out, right? Like it is just like going to the gym. You got to work that muscle out, work that listening muscle yeah. out. <laughs> Annually, that's how I do it. Annually. <laughs> yeah, I like it. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming on. I really want people to be able to follow you. Obviously, your book and your blog. Is there anywhere else people should follow you? I'm going to link to all that in the show notes. Anywhere else people can follow you or follow your exciting adventures? If they, if they just Google Barking Up Their Own Tree blog or if they Google Eric Barker blog, it'll come up signing up for my newsletter and the, the books on Amazon, Barking Up Their Own Tree. That's 
those are those are the big those are the big two. Awesome. So everyone, I will link to those in the show notes below. We got so many action steps out of this interview. Eric, thank you for letting me bounce from business to communication to science research. Um, anytime you want to practice your uh, talking and chatting skills, you're welcome to come back on the channel and we'll practice our conversation. But I want to appreciate I want thank you so much. I'm so appreciative of all your time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. This, this is great. I appreciate it. Oh, wait, don't go. You might also like these videos. Hmm, that one's really good. Watch it now.